Good evening. This is the second of two broadcasts examining the first three months of the Reagan administration. Tonight, we'll look at the Reagan foreign policy, including a massive increase in America's defense budget and tough talk, very tough talk, for the Russians. The only morality they recognize is what will further their cause, meaning they reserve under themselves the right to commit any crime, to lie, to cheat, in order to attain that. I think this administration, in addition to being tough, has to also emphasize its willingness to cooperate, to accommodate, to pursue those forms of agreement which are mutually beneficial, and that's particularly true of arms control. This is a CBS News special report. The first three months from Washington, here is Dan Rather. Three nights ago, on the first of these broadcasts, we looked at the style of the Reagan presidency, and we also examined his economic policy. As it happens, both of those elements are in the news again tonight. Mr. Reagan has announced plans to address a joint session of Congress next Tuesday evening to urge approval of his economic recovery program. That will be his first major public appearance since he was shot and gravely wounded more than three weeks ago. But there's more to the president's program than his economic package. Tonight, we'll focus on two other subjects. One is President Reagan's foreign policy. Another is the attempt to roll back federal regulations. Later on, we'll talk with some of the CBS News correspondents who have covered these stories. But now, let's start with foreign policy and this report from Diane Sawyer. As a candidate, Ronald Reagan didn't pretend to be an expert on foreign affairs, but he did say he knew something about the way Americans view the world. And he made three promises. A tough new U.S. posture toward Soviet aggression, a stronger defense at home and around the world, and he said that unlike the Carter crew, the Reagan team would speak with one consistent foreign policy voice. That included, of course, the voice of Secretary Haig, who promptly accused the Soviets of sponsoring international terrorism. They today are involved in conscious policies, in programs, if you will, which foster, support, and expand this activity, which is hemorrhaging in, in many respects throughout the world today. The Soviet ambassador was publicly turned away when he tried to enter the State Department garage by car, he was forced to walk in the door as the other diplomats do. Russian troop maneuvers near Poland were declared a threat to peace. Russian officials were accused of helping terrorists who had hijacked a Pakistani plane. And when Soviet and Cuban fingerprints showed up in El Salvador, the administration pulled out all the stops. I think we have made it very clear from the outset that this is a problem emanating first and foremost from Cuba and that it is our intention to deal with this matter at its source. The administration released this massive white paper designed to document Russian and Cuban involvement in El Salvador and they sent additional U.S. military advisors and economic and military aid. But perhaps more important, for the first time since Vietnam, an administration selected a country and a conflict and announced they were drawing the line. I want to emphasize because I think people's knuckles turn white when you uh, discuss this subject, and probably correctly so, that we're considering the full range of uh, American assets that can and uh, should appropriately be applied to the problems. Norman Podoritz, dean of Reagan's conservative intellectual supporters, says the attack on the Soviets proves their candidate is keeping his word. The single best thing the administration has done in foreign policy is to make it clear uh, that the rise of Soviet power, the decline of American power, uh, together pose an enormous danger to the survival of this country and of Western civilization. Zbigniew Brzezinski was the national security advisor to President Carter. He wonders if the rhetoric is all there is. 
Actually, I don't object to a tougher tone. I think it's useful. I don't object to a tougher style. I think it's also useful. But it's also important to give the Soviet Union some inducements for a more decent form of behavior, arms control, east-west contacts, and so forth. It's this balance which needs to be struck, and I don't feel that at least of now it has been struck. The administration moved quickly to keep its promise on defense, increasing the defense budget a massive $200 billion over five years. The Europeans were asked to increase their budgets too, and the administration began to open the arteries of U.S. military and economic aid to American friends all over the world. Arteries often blocked in the Carter administration by high ideals such as human rights. To signal a change on human rights, the new administration promptly invited Korean strongman Chun Doo Hwan for a state visit to prove that even authoritarian allies will have the blessing of this president. Nuclear non-proliferation would no longer inhibit U.S. aid either, the Pakistanis were told. And steps have also been taken to end Carter-era inhibitions about arms sales in general, paving the way for billions of dollars of additional arms to countries like Chile, Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, and in the Mideast region, Turkey, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, Saudi Arabia as the U.S. tries to build a strategic wall to keep the Soviets out. I would hope the signal that America has changed, that we have a much uh, different policy, much more of a national resolve, a willingness to uh, reduce sharply domestic spending so that we can repair some of the neglect and, and damage that has been caused by that neglect to our armed forces, that we're determined to restore the balance as the best means of producing peace. I hope all of these signals are getting through. But former Secretary of the Army Clifford Alexander told CBS News correspondent Bob Schieffer that the administration is spending too much too soon. It's far more important to analyze what our defense needs are vis-a-vis -vis any potential enemy and then decide how many dollars to put to it rather than decide I'm going to throw so many dollars at it. The sign one gets now is that we'll just throw the dollars at it. While the administration was concentrating on its first two promises, it stumbled on the third creating doubt and confusion about that one strong voice Mr. Reagan promised in foreign affairs. I was assured by President Reagan personally that I will be his chief administrator, if you will, and I use the term vicar, uh, for the conduct, for the formulation, the conduct, and the articulation of American foreign policy. I intend that the president's uh, mandate to me be carried out. And I'm confident it will be. Haig marched into the new administration armed with executive orders to codify his power, challenging David Stockman on State Department budget cuts when daring anyone to try to block his appointments. But I want you to know I anticipate that each and every one of my nominees, my nominee, will ultimately be uh, approved and hopefully confirmed in consultation with the Congress where appropriate. First, from the White House, there was silence, the kind that gathers with the storm. Then the other men around the president prepared a harsh initiation right for Haig. His executive order was trimmed, so was his budget. His appointments were delayed, and he rarely saw the president alone. And the vicar of foreign policy said he learned from a newspaper that his control of foreign policy crises had been taken away. In a congressional appearance, Haig broke rank with the rest of the president's team. Uh, I read with uh, interest and uh, I suppose a lack of enthusiasm the same newspaper reporting that you refer to. With the president watching, the White House staff slammed Haig hard, putting Vice President Bush in charge of crisis management. And Haig only made matters worse with his unexpected appearance before reporters the day the president was shot. Who makes that decision, As Mr. of Secretary, now, if I am can. in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president, and in, in close touch with him. If something came up, I would check with him, of course.
And in recent days, Secretaries Weinberger and Haig have been taking somewhat different public stands on arms talks with the Russians. April 14th, Weinberger said the mere threat of a Soviet invasion of Poland precludes arms talks anytime soon. And I wish that uh, we were able uh, to sit down and have uh, uh, meaningful uh, arms limitation talks, but uh, uh, when you've got 20, 25 divisions massed on the Polish border, why you don't have... Uh, uh, any kind of uh, atmosphere in which they could possibly succeed. But two days later, Haig showed his sensitivity to the Europeans. With NATO Secretary General Lunds at his side, Haig hinted that preliminary arms talks with the Russians may not be that far away. It will involve preliminary talks with the uh, Soviet representatives with the view towards having uh, negotiations, ultimately, that would seek to achieve the objective we're committed to. Haig has survived all this, but at some cost. It has hurt him, clearly, and it has hurt American foreign policy. I think both are retrievable. I think he can recoup. I hope he does, because he is, in some respects, the outstanding figure in this administration. Uh, some people believe that there is an ideological element involved in this uh, conflict between the White House and the State Department. I myself doubt that there's anything uh, seriously ideological mixed up in this. It's a matter of, uh, as they call it, a turf or power struggle. So, in foreign policy, the first three months of the Reagan administration have produced a verbal assault on the Russians, a major commitment of resources for U.S. defense and aid to America's friends, and the spectacle of bureaucratic infighting and disarray. And perhaps because of the bureaucratic tension, there's been no presentation of an overall foreign policy design. For instance, Reagan officials criticize the Russians, but they've given no administration proposal on SALT, our arms control. They say they worry about the Russians in the Mideast, too, and that's why they want to sell Saudi Arabia those controversial radar planes. But they've offered no plan for dealing with the central Arab-Israeli feud. And all the talk about communist infiltration in Central America has ended, submerged in the media blitz on the Reagan budget. And while initial actions in Africa and China appear to stress continuity with the Carter administration, everyone knows President Reagan hasn't fully addressed the tough political and diplomatic problems facing him in those regions. So, in foreign policy, the first three months of the Reagan administration have given the nation mixed signals from what the administration says about what it really intends to do. On another front, the domestic front, there is no question what the administration plans to do. It plans to cut back the amount of government red tape in our lives. Opponents question whether Mr. Reagan can do that and still protect the interests of workers and consumers and the environment. We'll be back shortly with a closer look at that argument. With a tree, you plant a little of yourself. Each ring is one more chapter in your life. As it marks each year that comes and goes, that tree will grow stronger if you trust its life to Job's. Job's tree and shrub, fruit tree, and evergreen spikes. The fertilizers you just pound in. You can trust its life to Job's. And indoors, Job's houseplant spikes, too. Job's, the easiest way to grow on Earth. It's coming along nicely, June. Yeah, but not for me. My doctor says too much caffeine makes me edgy. Well, why not try Sanka brand, the caffeinated coffee? I'll take real coffee. Sanka brand's 100% real coffee. You'll love it. Mmm, I do. June, the show is a big hit. Well, I'm really hitting it off with Sanka brand. <laughs> Sanka brand. Enjoy your coffee and enjoy yourself. But <laughs> Can't breathe. You didn't take your contact, did you? No. And you are going to work today. That's my man. Keep going. Charge. You choose. Label says take this, but only when you stay home. Take this, and you'll need six for just today. Six? Or take this one little contact. That settles it. But what's this improved? That's good. It means you'll get all their decongestant without their pain and cough things. I'll phone you from the office. Contact is the keeps you going cold medicine. Hello. <laughs> We took the best of all the rest. We took the cool, dry feeling of an antiperspirant spray, the long-lasting strength of a roll-on, and the convenience of a concentrated deodorant stick to bring you Dial Solid, an antiperspirant so much better than the leading aerosol. 
better than even the leading roll-on. It's the most advanced form of protection you can buy. Dial Solid. The dryness of a spray, strength of a roll-on, convenience of a stick. The best of all the rest. Government regulation. There's hardly an area of our lives where the federal government doesn't have a voice. Rules affecting the air we breathe, the water we drink, the products we buy, the way we do our work. Suppose a president didn't agree with all that regulation. Suppose he appointed as regulators men and women who believe that less regulation is better. Well, as Bob Schieffer points out, that appears to be what's happening. Those of us who call ourselves conservative have pointed out what's wrong with government policy for more than a quarter of a century. Now we have an opportunity to make policy and to change our national direction. We'll be able to keep... The economic plans have gotten most of the publicity, but in the long run, it is the people that Mr. Reagan is bringing into the government and their philosophies that will have most to do with changing national direction. And make no mistake, the new folks in town are ready to travel a new road. And I am satisfied that we will have an administration that speaks with one tongue, because the president is the leader. And he's drawn around himself people of like mind and like philosophy and like commitment. When Interior Secretary James Watt calls his Tuesday staff meeting at the Interior Department, the like-mindedness and the philosophy quickly surface. Okay, if we're going to cut two-thirds out of these assistant secretary offices, you bureau people have got... In private life as a Denver lawyer, Watt was often at odds with the government and environmentalists because he wanted to open federal lands to more development and mining. What makes a nice day for what is knowing someone can get along without the federal government. Let's develop some uh, letters to Domenici and particularly Congressman Yates and some of those people that are keep trying to jam money down our throat and show them this example that uh, local governments are willing and able to do the job and we don't need those federal funds. It's been... Uh, a great experience. Too. Watt has already tried to clear the way for more mining and development of federal land, has proposed cutbacks in national parks, and has ordered a speed up in the controversial program to encourage offshore oil and gas drilling. Environmentalists are so upset, they're already calling for his removal. Rafe Pomerantz, president of the Friends of the Earth. We're not going to accept uh, trying to turn back the tremendous growth and progress we've made in establishing national parks in uh, making uh, mining safer and cleaner and cleaning up water pollution it's uh... cleaning up the air we just we cannot let it stop because of a few appointments in in one administration watt has drawn most of the fire but he is just one of dozens of new policymakers whose philosophy is strikingly different from the previous administration so different that some liberals claim the foxes are now in charge of the chicken coop a sampler of the most controversial nominations James Harris. He once argued federal strip mining laws were unconstitutional. The president now wants him to head the Office of Surface Mining. Robert Burford. He once promoted legislation to nullify government ownership of federal land. The president wants him to head the Bureau of Land Management. Ann Gorsuch. As a Colorado state legislator, she argued the state should give responsibility for policing hazardous waste to counties. She's been picked to head the Environmental Protection Agency. John Crowell. He criticized policies limiting timber cutting on federal land. The president wants him to head the Forest Service. Ernest Lefevre, a leading critic of U.S. human rights policies, he is the choice to head the Bureau of Human Rights at the State Department. Thorn Ochter, a building contractor, he wants to cut down the rulemaking authority of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. He's Mr. Reagan's choice to run that agency. Watt and others in the administration say the appointment should be no surprise that this is what the election and the Reagan mandate were all about. And Watt, for one, believes the criticism will soon subside. How many times can you charge that Ronald Reagan is putting a fox in charge of the hen house? It's an empty, shallow call, and, and our track record will dissipate whatever credibility some of you might have thought it had in the first place. We've been able to shrug our shoulder and turn away. We know it has no credibility. What the Reagan people turned to almost immediately was a major effort to reduce federal regulations. Vice President Bush, who heads the effort, clearly relishes the task. A lot of the regulations just kind of grew on themselves, fed on themselves like giant amoebae out there. 
multiplying through osmosis and all these marvelous things we learn. I'll tell you, it's like schmooze down there in Lower Slobovia. You hit one and 25 others spring up, and we're going to do something about it. Hearing it discussed in general terms is one thing, but when you examine specifics, you come to realize just how many areas of everyday life might be affected. Here are just a few of the regulations under review. Rules on contents of pesticides, testing and marketing of new drugs, job noise levels, affirmative action programs, hospital and nursing home certification, rules on handling chemical waste, Medicaid, national parks, strip mining, rules governing oil and gas exploration, rules for licensing nuclear power plants, workplace safety standards, air pollution guidelines, gas rationing procedures, and the entire range of federal programs for the handicapped, from schools to access to public transportation. But once the regulations are rolled back, what happens then? Virginia Nauer is the president's consumer affairs advisor. This is the great opportunity for business and industry to prove what they've been saying that they could do, self-regulate. But unfortunately, within this first hundred days of the Reagan administration, I don't know of any industry that's really come forward and said, this is what we will do voluntarily to solve the problem. So that really becomes the president's next problem. The administration is heading in the direction that Mr. Reagan promised during the campaign. But can private interests now be encouraged to take the initiatives that government is relinquishing? That, of course, is one of those questions that can't be answered yet and won't be for some time. Some of Mr. Reagan's advisors concede that if it doesn't work, if industry doesn't seize this opportunity to police itself, then the government will have to move back in. We'll be back in a minute with some of our colleagues at CBS News to examine further these first three months of the Reagan presidency. Your baby is upstairs, isn't she? Taking a nap, all snug and secure. Beautiful little girl. But while she's sleeping and your wife's in the kitchen cooking dinner, something deadly could be spreading all over your house. Carbon monoxide. Because you installed an automatic vent damper yourself instead of having the job done by a qualified professional. You could lose your life because of a faulty or improperly installed vent damper or heat extractor. So have them installed professionally and write the Consumer Product Safety Commission for free vital information on energy saving devices. Save your energy and a lot more. Write Energy Savers, Washington, D.C., 20207. That's Energy Savers, Washington, D.C., 20207. Product safety. It's no accident. With us tonight are a number of the CBS News correspondents who have worked with us preparing these broadcasts at the White House, in the press room there, Leslie Stahl and Bill Plant. At the State Department, Diane Sawyer, and here in our studios, Bruce Morton and Bob Schieffer. Leslie Stahl at the White House, were you surprised at the announcement that President Reagan would be appearing before that joint session of Congress next Tuesday night? Well, frankly, Dan, I was. Uh, over the past two days, we've heard some talk about a possible radio speech of about 10 minutes long, a little hint that maybe the president wouldn't be up to even a television appearance, and now we hear that he's going to be able to go before a joint appearance of Congress to promote his economic program. I was surprised. But of course, uh, they do have some new indications that his popularity is surging. Uh, his pollster, Richard Worthland, told me that his hardcore support has doubled since the assassination attempt, and they clearly want to take advantage of this. They feel he has a new personal stature. One aide told me uh, it's the new John Wayne image. They want to put this to use. They want to help uh, use this to help promote the economic program. And clearly, they uh, say the president very much wants to do this himself. Leslie, do, is this John Wayne image something they'd like to see uh, happen or something they get an indication from their polls is happening? Uh, I, I gather they feel it is happening. The people feel that he went through the uh, crisis, the shooting, with great courage and aplomb, uh, and that he showed that he's a man of uh, great steel and strength. Bill Plant, uh, is there any indication that the president has decided to do this because his economic recovery program, or particularly the tax cut portion of it, may be in trouble? Dan, absolutely. The economic program is tied directly, the politics of it, to Ronald Reagan's popularity. And it's time for him, in the view of the staff, to take charge again of the selling job on the economic program because they have known for some time that they're going to have the most difficulty with the tax section of the program. 
Congress just simply, most of the, uh, most of the members, is not in favor of a three-year tax cut program. Congress is willing to settle probably for one, maybe two. And the compromise is likely to be a sense of the Congress resolution promising another year or another two years of tax cuts, but it'll be a non-binding one. So if they're going to do the kind of selling job they want, Ronald Reagan has to take charge. That's just the plain, simple politics of it, and they're going to trade on his popularity to do it. If two-year tax cut is the best the president can get, would he sign or veto that bill? He'd probably sign it if there is some kind of promise directly uh, implied but uh, not binding for a third year. Diane Sawyer at the State Department, uh, tomorrow the lifting of the grain embargo, at least a limited lifting of the grain embargo against the Soviet Union is supposed to be announced. I assume that Secretary of State Haig will get on board and back that. Well, Dan, it's interesting. He's made a point of letting reporters know that, in fact, he does not back that, that he is still opposed to lifting the grain embargo and that he's going to slug it out to the end. The problem is his message has been so pointed it may seem a little bit calculated to a lot of us, namely designed to signal the Russians that there is still a tough guy in the administration despite the apparently generous administration move anticipated tomorrow. Diane, does Secretary of State Haig last in that job or does he go and go fairly soon? I think he lasts because I think what he still needs is the support of the president. I think the president has not been paying attention to foreign policy. I think once the president's attention moves from the economic side to the foreign policy side, he'll see that he's got to stand behind his secretary of state and automatically you'll see the secretary's position bolstered enormously. Bruce Morton, in brief, uh, the principal positive aspect of these first three months of the Reagan administration and principal negative from the president's point of view. Well, I think the positive is, is simply consistency. It's uh, the line, uh, what you see is what you get. They've done what they said they were going to do. And Mr. Reagan has succeeded, I think, more than some recent presidents in keeping the country's eye on his goal. He's focused the national attention on that economic program. He's got people thinking about the budget cuts. And that's a big success. If I had to pick a weakness, I suppose maybe it would be a personnel. They have an awful lot of unconfirmed appointees rattling around here in uh, the State Department, uh, where Diane is, and in other areas. They, they, they've just been very slow with that. Do you think that the President has in mind trying to get, seriously trying to get, a Republican House of Representatives during his presidency? No question. A lot of money budgeted for that. Bob Schieffer, number one plus, number one minus of the first three months of the Reagan administration. I, I agree with Bruce on the plus, and they have managed to keep that focus even while having this crisis of the president being being hospitalized. The minus, if there is one, I think, Dan, <clears throat> is this. It, there's no question now that they were kidding us a bit about how badly the president was wounded when the, when the shooting took place. And it seems to me uh, that they were less than candid. It seems to me when presidents start to get in trouble around this town, when people start to get in trouble, is they worry, can the American people take bad news? Uh, Lyndon Johnson got in trouble on that on Vietnam. He worried could the people be told what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, if you don't tell them the bad news, they're not going to remember the good news, and they're not going to remember the good news. So I think uh, that that, if I were to list a minus, it would be that. Bruce, is there any real prospect in your judgment, asking for an opinion, that we could have a Republican House of Representatives under a Reagan administration? Dan, I think if the Reagan administration makes some progress on the economy, we could have a generation of Republican politics. It would do what Roosevelt did for the Democrats uh, after 32. Bob Schieffer, where are the Democrats? I haven't heard from a Democrat in months. Well, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the honeymoon still goes on. Uh, I think in these two broadcasts we have seen, we have not seen any really serious criticism of Mr. Reagan as yet. Of course, a part of that is he really hasn't done anything as yet. Uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't seen the bite, the other side of what Mr. Reagan wants to do. He talks about the programs he wants to cut. We haven't seen a program cut as yet, so we, we haven't had an opportunity to see how that's going to hit at the grassroots level. Uh, I think very much right now they're laying low and trying to regroup, and they haven't grouped as yet, in my view. Thank you all very much. We'll be back shortly with some final thoughts on these first three months of the Reagan presidency. <laughs>
Polyden presents Martha Ray, movie star, denture wearer. Folks, I've used Polyden for years, but now there's something that cleans my dentures even better. It's fantastic. New Extra Strength Polyden. Watch it work on this tough lab stain. New Extra Strength Polyden has 50% more of a special stain remover. 50% more. Gets those stains clean, even in between. So take it from a big mouth. New Polyden Green gets tough stains clean with extra strength. Let me tell you about one feminine pad today that more and more women are switching to. It's the new Freedom Maxi Pad. It's better than the leading pad. The new Freedom Maxi is the only pad with rounded corners and tapered ends. So it's much more comfortable than the leading pad. Try new Freedom Maxi and discover what lots of women already know. A better idea means a lot more comfort. New Freedom, now with three adhesive strips. Hey, Bill, does your mouthwash fight bad breath in the morning as long as Listerine? Just as long. Uh, uh, uh. uh almost as long. Uh, uh, uh. Long enough? Uh, uh, uh. Listerine Strong works hours longer than your number two mouthwash. And Listerine antiseptic kills the germs that can cause bad breath. Today's a good morning. Listerine, is there any nicer way to say good morning? Uh, uh. How much can you learn about a president during his first three months? Well, sometimes a great deal, and we expect that is true of Ronald Reagan. We've learned, for one thing, that his campaign speeches were serious. He is doing what he said he would do, trying to reduce the role of government in our lives, urging both tax cuts and spending cuts, sometimes at the expense of programs designed to help the poor. We've learned that he views the world as a confrontation. The good guys, us. The bad guys, the Russians. Much of his foreign policy flows from that. We've learned that he can put together a smoothly functioning staff. We've learned that he knows how to cultivate Congress. His speech next Tuesday night is another example. We've learned that he is stronger than his years might indicate. The shooting dramatized that. There are two things we still don't know about Mr. Reagan's programs. One, will they pass? That's up to Congress. Two, will they work? That's up to history. But more than most presidents, Ronald Reagan has staked out his programs early. He has given us, in these first three months, the blueprint by which his presidency will be judged. For CBS News, Dan Rather in Washington, we'll be back tomorrow with the CBS Evening News. Until then, good night. This has been a CBS News special report. The first three months. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. This is CBS. This is CBS.